you know, this movie had a couple of working titles, but one one of the working titles that really kills me because it was the first working title for the film was Teeny Weenies. Woof. That's right up there with our Willy Millie. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is this is less direct than Willy Millie because like they're not being quite as literal. But <laughs> literal but I, I mean, Weenies. technically, but I mean, could I expect any less from, you know, folks like Stuart Gordon and Brian Usna and Dennis Paoli, <laughs> you know, pe- pe- I mean, people who have made delectable trash, I think being involved so heavily involved in like the construction of this movie, you know, honey, I made the kids into teeny weeny. There's your title. <laughs> honey, the kids have been teeny weeny fight. <laughs> the kids have been teen- honey honey i shrunky dunked the kid no honey i shrinky dink <laughs> the kids there we go honey <laughs> honey i've turned the kids into shrinky dinks <laughs> greetings loyal listeners and new recruits i'm drew deach i'm travis newton and this is genre vision Genre Vision is a weekly movie club where we discuss horror films, action movies, fantasy flicks, sci-fi cinema, and more. And it's a new month and a new theme. We're doing March Madness, an entire month of mad scientist movies. And we're starting things off with Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, the 1989. I, is it fair to call a classic? I feel like I, I feel like it's certainly fallen out of uh, notoriety. I would hesitate to call it a classic. I mean, they're trying to revive the franchise right now, but I, I sure. could say it is maybe a cult favorite, um, maybe not a cult classic. Okay. I, I mean, it was certainly a cornerstone of Disney uh, when we were, I mean, you know, I, I was I was born in 88. Uh, I believe Travis, you were born in 87. Correct. So yeah, yeah it was so- around, uh, there were three movies, one direct to video uh, and a television series that spawned from this. And now they're trying to see if they can revive the property again. So it was a, it was a commodity, you know, a well-known commodity at the time. There was a, uh, an attraction at uh, Walt Disney world based on this mm-hmm. that I think I went through several times and that was fun. Yep. Honey, I shrunk the audience. That's right. Yeah. had some fun, fun air jet effects and, you know, smell effects and spray effects, things like that. Yep. I mean, the, the, the point being that this was a, a pretty sizable cornerstone of the Disney monolith of, of, of you know, of our marketing and mer- yeah. yes. And, and merchandising for throughout pretty much, I would say the majority of the nineties, if not all of the nineties, this was a, a an extremely successful movie, but a very intriguing one when you look at its origins, because this movie has story credits for Stuart Gordon and Dennis Paoli, who are probably best known for their work on such movies as Reanimator, From Beyond, uh, you know, just these. Uh, uh, they, I, I believe they did um, Dagon together, <laughs> the movie that everybody's seen. You're also forgetting about Brian Usna who had worked with Stuart Gordon on many things. I have society, he did the bride, he did bride of reanimator and beyond uh, reanimator. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he was able to get, you know, uh, based on characters by credits for all of the honey, I shrunk this stuff. Um, so he's, you know, he's a part of this and this was kind of conceived, I think to be in a, in a way, a smaller film, <laughs> you know, I didn't think, nah, 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 you nah, know, nah. uh, that Stuart Gordon and Dennis Paoli really had, such huge ambitions for this kind of story um, because, you know, it was decidedly less marketable when they were first shopping it around. You know, there are things you read online about earlier versions of this script. Like there was once an additional kid who died during the event, one of the adventure sequences in the film, uh, you know, it went under several working titles, one of which was the big backyard, which I think is actually a fairly accurate title to sell the script yep. and eventually wound up at Disney as a, you know, a spec script by these guys. And they thought, Ooh, this could make a, a good Disney live action picture. Yeah. And, uh, the, the movie kicks off with an animated credit sequence, which feel like I, I, I should have looked this up as to who was maybe who directed this or was directing. Well, I didn't catch it when we were watching the credits. Because it it feels very kind of, I felt like it it reminded me of like 50s advertisements as far as the style of the kids and stuff. And it's this very, you know, it's it's pretty much selling you on the premise right away was showing these two cartoon kids being shrunk down and uh, having to avoid different pitfalls of being tiny. The most important thing I think in this opening credit sequence, though, is the music by James Horner. The music here is... First of all, you're going to be hearing it a lot, and we will talk about that. 
But more so, there's a really interesting bit of trivia attached to the music and the theme that James Horner composed. And I say composed a little lightly because he pretty much directly ripped it off. He stole it legally uh, because there was an, uh, there was <laughs> yes. an out-of-court settlement. Horner's score rather heavily incorporates motifs from a very famous piece uh, called Powerhouse that was composed by a composer named Raymond Scott. And if you recognize this melody, you'll know what Powerhouse is. While Horner doesn't quote it verbatim, it's there enough that it's actually, you know, they went and found the actual sheet music and the, the score. Like, yeah, it was it was there on the cue sheets. So, yep. oh, whoops, whoopsie daisy. So I don't know if that was Horner's slip up or that was part of the legal team slip up when they were trying to clear everything. Uh, but it definitely <laughs> resulted in a settlement. Anyway, back to this animated opening. Uh, I wasn't a huge fan of the way the, the movie opens because it doesn't really give you a good sense of what the movie is actually going to be like and really further delays, I think, the movie from getting started. Uh, it's all these sort of like domestic scenarios like running away from the dustbuster or, you know, getting shoved into the toaster and things like that. And that's really not what this movie is. I think the title The Big Backyard is way more descriptive because the movie is racing to get to that moment. Yes, yeah, so we're, we're going to talk about the pacing of this movie. Um, I, I enjoy the animated sequence on its own. I get that it's it's selling you on the premise more so than even like the title is. I mean, I think the title is genuinely a great title. Like it's the most high concept title you could go for yeah. with this kind of a story. Um, and I think it's one of the reasons I think genuinely it's one of the reasons why the movie was so popular is because you see on, you know, when you're going to the movie theater and you see, all right, what's on here, uh, you know. Uh, movie titles that mean nothing to you, like afterthought and burning desire retribution. Yeah. Stuff yeah. like that. <laughs> like nobody, it's like, I don't know. But when you see honey, I shrunk the kids, you know what you're getting immediately. Yeah. And so the, this animated sequence puts you right. It's like, this is what we're going to give you. It's going to be kids shrunk down dealing with big shit. And it's like, okay, great. Then the movie starts and the movie never stops. Oh my God. And the score keeps persisting throughout this first act where we're establishing eight main players. This is an ensemble film, and there are eight members of that ensemble. So you have the two Zielinski children. You know, there's the young Zielinski boy who's very nerdy and takes after his dad, played by Rick Moranis. You have the young Zielinski uh, daughter who is a teen, played by somebody who looks like the, she looks like the protagonist from uh, Black Mirror, um, San Junipero. <laughs> <laughs> she, she was in Terminator Dark uh, Dark Fate. Yeah. Yeah. You um, know who I'm talking about. Oh, Mackenzie Thomas. Gosh. What's her name? Yes. Mackenzie Davis. <laughs> Retribution. <Yeah>. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you've got, obviously you got the Zelensky parents. Um, you know, you've got uh, Rick Moranis and Marcia Strassman as the Zelenskys. And then you have their next door neighbors, the Thompsons, played by Matt Frewer, um, who you'll recognize from many, many movies. Christine Sutherland is the mom, who you'll recognize as Buffy's mom from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the series. And then you have the two Thompson kids, a teenage one who seems kind of shy, but, you know. Uh, and then there's the younger Thompson kid who's a total shithead. It's a lot. It's a lot. that This movie has to race through it all, too. It really can't take its time with any of this because it's trying to get to a particular moment that isn't until like half an hour in. Uh, and with so many characters to set up, it's like, woof, it's spending the absolute minimum amount of time in every scene and with every character. It's a prime example of a film using shorthand. There is so much shorthand in this first act to basically tell you everything about the characters without really telling you anything about the characters. And when I know that sounds very stupid, like when I say it. Well, well, they have to get all the archetypal stuff out of the way so you understand like what kind of box a character fits in and what the dynamic's going to be like. You took the word right out of my mouth. Is These are not characters. We will soon come to learn. While there are things that help characterize them, these are archetypes. Yes. Pure and simple. And, and there's, on the one hand, the part of me that actually really likes that because it means we know exactly who these characters are before they say a line of dialogue, mm -hmm. that's how like crystal cut they are. There's something really appealing about that because then it is like, we don't have to worry about trying to get to the marquee value of what we're here for. Honey, I shrunk the kids. However, 
the fact that this is pretty much all shorthand and all tropes for these characters means that for the most part, none of them ever come across as anything more than one dimensional cartoons. Right. The dynamics between the characters are really not terribly specific. And this is partly a symptom of there being so many characters in the film. They do oddly enough work in some very specific beats uh, with characters who really aren't terribly central to the plot. And we'll get to that kind of stuff later, but they, they try and build in as much specificity as they can, which is to say not much things like Matt Furrer's character trying to butch up his, uh, older teen son by having him lift weights. And, you know, it turns out Matt Furrer's character can't even lift the weight himself. And, you know, he's trying to quit smoking. Like there are all these little details. So I can recognize and I can see the effort putting into like giving the characters specific traits, but they're highly recognizable and frequently used traits that overall give the impression that's like, yeah, this is all familiar in terms of like, oh, suburban family dynamic, white suburban family dynamic, I should say. I think you're hitting on a very illuminating term, traits. Traits do not make a character. Like characters can have traits, but traits do not necessarily cement what a character is. Now, there are certain people in this movie that do better with what they're given than others. Matt Frewer runs away with this movie. Yeah. He seems to be the most aware of the limitations and the kind of tone that he's working in. Um, his character is this wacky, you know, I, I, he's not a stereotype, but certainly. Well, a, I think it's a stereotype. Of what exactly? You know, he doesn't have a, he doesn't have a Reagan sign in his front lawn. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's, that's being a little too topical. I, I would say this is something that we kind of experienced with Harry and the Hendersons, where it's very easy to see why this became a television series and was able to spin off is because this is like a sitcom character. This is that neighbor. Yeah, he's he's the neighbor over the fence, the annoying neighbor over the fence. Sure. Right. And and his specific thing is that in, in this is that he he's getting ready to go on a big fishing trip and he's got some buddy of his, you know, some other couple that they're going to go on this big fishing trip with and they're getting ready to go out. So the entire pretty much the entire movie, uh, he is in this fishing gear waiting to go on this fishing trip. He's just, you know, it reminds me somewhat of the beginning of Harry and the Hendersons where John Lithgow is, you know, yeah, we're out here hunting and I'm hunting man and I like hunting and my boy needs to like hunting because I like hunting and my boy needs to like hunting. I'm going to try and enforce these, uh, you know, tenets, certain tenets of masculinity that I feel are very important upon my young impressionable son. Sure. Yes. And and so like that, that that's there, Matt, Fre but because it's Matt Frewer, that role could have been played by like a John Goodman or a Martin Mull. And I think it would lean more into what you would kind of expect with that particular stereotype of that neighbor of that big butch man neighbor. But the fact that it's Matt Frewer who could have easily played the Rick Moranis part. Sure. Yeah. Like the fact that it's Matt Frewer adds something very interesting. And so much of that comes across purely in his performance and comedic timing. He has the best comedic timing of anybody in the movie. It surprises me that we're able to talk about a single character in this movie for that long. Well, it's just Matt. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's the only he's the only one. That's the thing is yeah. that it and it's because of Matt Frewer. It's not how the character is written. It's what Matt Frewer is able to do with the character. Now, on the subject of Rick Moranis, we love Rick Moranis here at Genre Vision. Yes. Huge fans of Rick Moranis and seemingly a pretty pretty decent human being. When we came into doing, you know, Mad Scientist Month, we were like, oh honey, yeah, he's Rick Moranis. He'll be, you know, kooky and wild and everything. This movie somehow manages, and maybe this is the fault of the script, it somehow manages to sand off all the really fun, goofball, endearing edges that we know Rick Moranis has. Yeah. And this is another symptom of this being such a, a large ensemble cast is like the title, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, kind of implies that there will be more sort of from his perspective as the sort of problem solver and the one who can fix the situation in the story and what screen time he does get, he's rarely able to make that screen time feel like he it's playing to the best of his abilities. He's also not affecting the plot, right? Yeah. There's so much stuff that goes on with the parents that does not advance the plot at all. And every single one of the parent characters falls victim to a scene like that or scenes, plural like that. 
it is rough. Basically, while the kids are going on their big backyard adventure in the second act of the film, the parents are dicking around. <laughs> well, I mean, even if they're not dicking, because there's, you know, once Rick Moranis has realized that the kids have been shrunk, there's a huge swath of the movie is him attempting to find them in the backyard. And he's just kind of stuck in that holding pattern for pretty much the entire second act. Yeah. Like there's nothing progressing now granted it's actually the moment where rick moranis gets to be funny because he gets to do a lot of physical comedy like he realizing that the kids are in the backyard he doesn't want to step on the grass so he walks over to the fence and climbs up on it and is you know trying to shimmy along the fence and then uh he rigs some kind of thing with the the clotheslines and stuff out there so they can be hanging over while he's looking at everything and visually and the physical comedy of it is funny but it is not doing anything to advance his character or to advance the plot, you know, just put another plot beat out there. It, it really doesn't do anything. For instance, like it would be one thing for him to set up this sort of crane rig so that he can hover over the lawn and look out for the kids. But he actually never uses that to ever find the kids. He never once locates them. And it, and so this whole endeavor really doesn't end up feeling like a, a significant plot beat. Uh, it is a plot beat, certainly, but it ultimately kind of feels like um, a, a fruitless endeavor, a waste of time. One of the reasons that so many scenes kind of feel fruitless in this movie is because every scene lasts what I feel is the minimum amount of time for the scene to take place. And the trouble with that is it lets almost no moment in the film land because it doesn't want to hesitate for for the for the moment to actually have weight or any impact. Instead, it breezes right past it and is on to the next thing and on to the next thing and on to the next thing. And that does this movie such a disservice. Oh, it's my least favorite thing about the movie overall. It does, and we'll we'll get to that a little bit later because it's it's important. Now it sounds like we've been kind of down on this movie so far. So I I want to change the tone of the conversation because when you're talking about the marquee value of Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, you are expecting, okay, it's a shrinking movie. There have been shrinking movies before in the past, but every time that there is a premise that is presented to an audience that is specifically effects-driven, there is an expectation that you are going to push the envelope with the filmmaking and the effects you know, work and everything like that. You know, uh, d Dinosaurs are going to show up in Valley of the Guanji or King Kong. When you get to Jurassic Park, people are expecting, well, you're 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 promising us the dinosaur movie of of its age, deliver. Honey I Shrunk the Kids is a phenomenal and truly incredible film when it comes to being an effects film about shrinking. Right. This is an effects showcase, and all of the effects revolve around scale or faking scale incredible, I guess what you could call bigatures, you know, they're, they're things that are small made entirely way too big. And the scale of it isn't really driven by any kind of measurable scientific, you know, Oh, I think the kids are a quarter inch tall or anything like that. It's like, sometimes the kids look four or five millimeters tall. Sometimes they look twice that size, depending on like what giant prop they've decided to blow up. It's like, Oh, the little kid fits in the, um, you know, the, the hole in, in a Cheerio or they can rest, you know, two of them can rest inside the, uh, the hole in a, a bottom of a, a, a Lego brick and things like that. It's like the, the scale of things is constantly changing. And the only reason it changes is because the movie is like, what seems fun. And I like that it's driven by that. You know, this script is really centered around creating fun gags in the structure. And Stuart Gordon was originally supposed to direct this. He fell ill and was replaced by Joe Johnston who is uh, an incredible effects artist and for many years worked as an art director at Industrial Light and Magic, uh, heavily involved in the production of the Star Wars films. Directed The Rocketeer, which is a very good movie. Yeah, this was the movie that got him the Rocketeer job because prior to Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, he'd only made like a student film. So this was his first feature. I think as an effects artist overseeing this movie, it's like, yeah, that was, that was the correct choice because this film really is at its best and really best remembered as an effects showcase. Yeah, and I mean, it's not just the pure, because when we talk about effects filmmaking, it's not them directors in general. There are so many hands in this, you know, so many different departments who are in charge of certain sequences in an effects film. And, but I will say this, is that Johnston infuses the movie, like, and, and this 
plays into, I think, our larger issue with the the speed of it all. But this is a positive one. He infuses the movie with real kineticism without without being overly showy, um, without being so, you know, assaulting that it becomes tiring. Right. The kineticism of the movie doesn't come across as like manic. No. There's a scene, for instance, where two of the kids get latched onto a bee and the bee flies around the yard. And then, you know, uh, there's this really uh, inventive sequence with a handheld camera that moves around as the background plate for this bee flying around. Obviously they had to have several camera operators because at one point the camera crosses over the fence into the Thompson's yard and then crosses back over the fence back into the Zelensky's yard. So there had to be multiple camera operators running around at very high speed with a big heavy camera and passing it off seamlessly. So there's a lot of inventive effects work that goes into stuff like this. The only trouble I have with it is like, it all goes by so quickly that I don't feel like I've had the proper time to enjoy it. I, uh, I like 75% agree with you. The effect stuff is all the stuff that really stuck with me from whenever I said, because I didn't really grow up with this movie, I should say. I definitely saw it at least once, but I, I, I feel like I was older, but I really couldn't tell you when I saw it. But it was not like a, a I didn't own it, you know, anything like that. But the things that I remember from seeing it are all of the effect stuff. For example, uh, when they get shrunk and as soon as they can, you know, this movie gets them immediately into the backyard. Uh, the movie as that kind of showcase takes off and there's just so many awesome, awesome moments from the very beginning, they get stuck in a trash bag and they have to cut open the trash bag. And there's this beautiful shot inside of the trash bag as the kids rip it open and are looking up through the lawn and see their house in the distance. Yeah. And it's, it's a, it, it fills you with wonder and adventure and, you know, even a little bit of terror, like it's such a good shot. It's a great moment. And I really do feel like it is one of like the selling moments of the movie because it is, you know, and you and I were watching this together and, you know, in sync, I was like, oh, this is our not in Kansas anymore moment. And then one character says, we're not in Kansas anymore. And I was like, ah, God damn it. He said the thing. The movie knew exactly what it was doing, but I wish, you know, I wish that moment had just been a little bit longer to land. You know, what I'm thinking of in moments like this, obviously, in addition to the iconic, you know, entrance into Oz, uh, I'm thinking of things like when Willy Wonka opens the door into the chocolate room. Mm -hmm. That is a very lovingly constructed sequence where you can fucking see the wonder because the camera's like, look at it, bitch. (laughs) We we had to build all of this, just get every... You know, use every single shot that we can. I'm saying, like, Honey, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids could have done a lot of that because the effects, the sets, the matte paintings, everything is so impressive. And when they actually manage to ground the action and build a moment of, like, character development or emotion, integrating those effects, it's like, this is working. More of this, please. And, and, and I mean, there, there's so much of that because the, the big chunk of the movie is them in the backyard. So it's just a bunch of these backyard shrunk shenanigans um (laughs) that was very difficult to say every time it does something yes i I agree that it it flies by but it's never not impressive for example the sprinklers get turned on and they have these uh i believe cg animated uh sprinkler drops that then hit the ground and and they have these gigantic explosions and you had made the point that it's like to get this really big giant explosion of water to create a cool scale. It's not really water so much that they're shooting up when they're running through. It's these big vats of slime. Yeah. Well, one of the cool things they had to realize is like, if you scale everything down, surface tension and viscosity does not scale down with it. In fact, it's going to scale up ridiculously. So like droplets of water held together by surface tension are going to be huge. And, you know, Bugs Life, for instance, did did similar gags with that, which are pretty fun. Mm -hmm. But you wouldn't see, like, fine vapor and spray of water. And so when you have splashes, they're not going to look like splashes as we see them at full scale. They're going to look like something, you know, something gooey, like way more viscosity, way more surface tension. So they added a fucking, I don't know, a ton of methyl cell ky yeah exactly yeah. something to just goop and thicken this water up and so these splashes look incredible and there's a really really great sequence the sprinkler sequence is one of my favorites in the film 
And then, you know, when one of the kids falls into the water, they have to make it like super goopy and muddy and things like that. Um, it's, it's a really cool sequence and it's, it lasts a surprisingly long time for this movie. Yeah. I mean, uh, all of this stuff, the, the, the effect stuff. And again, you know, they're, they're passing off to different people. Um, it really works for me because one of the things that I really like about the movie is that it does end up being a creature movie because it's like, all right, they're going to be in the backyard. There's going to be insects and animals. So we, you know, they see the bees and the bees look, Oh, I just love the, the, the bees when they come in, they look so awesome. Yeah. I love the the hairiness of the bees. Like, you know, and that's yeah. the big chunks of pollen and stuff like that it looks incredible. Yeah. It's wonderful. The ant obviously is like a star of the show. It's like another member of the ensemble. Yep, yeah, uh, you know, we, we we worship at the church of Dr. Mandible on the Mandalorian, uh, the wonderful <laughs> ant puppet. Justice for Dr. Mandible. That's right. Yes, yes, yes. Give I'll, I'll watch 40 seasons of the Dr. Mandible show on Disney+. Plus. I'll buy seven subscriptions if you make the Dr. Yeah. Mandible show. Amy Sedaris and Dr. Mandible jet around the galaxy doing nothing. Oh, my God. You couldn't – I couldn't buy a subscription fast enough. Um <laughs> So, so the point being, like, we like big, ridiculous ant puppets, and this movie has a big, ridiculous ant puppet. I say ridiculous, I'm not being dismissive. I love this giant ant. It's ridiculously huge. It's certainly not yeah. worthy of ridicule because it's worthy of great praise. I love this ant. It's wonderful, and uh, it is a big, practical puppet that they had to make. Uh, you know, in the story, the kids are able to uh, turn it into one of the gang by, like, tempting it with a piece of a big oatmeal cream pie that they you know of course they get to go up and like oh look at look at this wonderful product place when we get with kids getting to just scoop giant handfuls of oatmeal cream pie cream into the it's like um but they they get this ant and they're like oh we can ride the ant and he'll get us to the house faster and so they rig up you know a, a carrot and stick type thing uh, except with a piece of oatmeal cream pie and uh then the ant eventually befriends them and becomes a buddy and then scorpion shows up and the scorpion is animated by our man phil tippett go motion baby so uh, yeah if you like that particular brand of uh phil tippett stop motion that he calls go motion because it incorporates uh motion blur uh you'll be in hog heaven we certainly were uh this scorpion attack is so fun i don't know but this has got to be up there with his some of his best go motion work ever uh, oddly enough, I think Willow best this with the three headed dragon thing in the, in the late second act of that movie. Go listen to our Willow episode. This scorpion rules. I love how red and striking it is. Uh, it is a, a big, scary monster in the best of ways. Now I should say we're going to get back to score because I love the scorpion, but I do want to, th- there's an important moment that we need to acknowledge because of our main criticism about this movie's going, 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 going. There is never a moment in the first 50, I think it's like 52, 53 minutes that this movie ever breathes. Even the moments that it thinks, uh, there are moments early on that it thinks it's breathing, but it's really not because those breath moments really are just like Matt Furrer will have a funny joke or we just have to really quickly get across a shorthand bit of character so we can get this out of the way and get to the backyard. But at about 52, 53 minutes in, I messaged you because the characters actually stopped and like sat down at a place and talked to each other that was not advancing the plot that was advancing their character dynamics. And I messaged you and said like, Hey, look a moment, right? Yeah. We really did have to wait like 52 minutes for the characters to like sit down, take a breath and realize just how bad things were for them in that moment and how they felt about it. This is one of the things that I absolutely detest about, you know, the whole process of executives not liking a movie or uh, a movie not testing well in test screenings. It's like, well, if we think the audience is bored, we're going to cut this down to its absolute bare minimum and make sure no scene lasts any longer than it absolutely has to. You know, it's approaching the movie, you know, from an editorial sense, it's like a piece of machinery where it's like, well, what can we whittle down to its absolute bare minimum? And often that approach, just, that approach just sucks the life out of a movie. This movie could have stood to, to be, I don't know, a solid eight or nine minutes longer. And especially like when you consider the kind of things that it's spending its time on with the parents, it's like you wasted time. You know, you tried to whittle, whittle down so much out of this movie's running time by, you know, compressing it and compressing it and compressing it. And then you'll have scenes like 
Matt Frewer's buddy comes over who's supposed, who's supposed to take him on this fishing trip and they have an absolute useless and stupid conversation. The scene ends with Matt Frewer getting his buddy's fish hook stuck in his fingers as a joke. And I'm like, this is wasted time. This is not a plot beat. This doesn't tell us anything new about the characters. It's not terribly funny. It is just a reel that shouldn't be in this fucking print. You're picking a, a moment I would be kinder to. I'm going to tell you what the real genuine garbage part of this movie is. And that is the relationship between Rick Moranis' character, Wayne, and, and his wife. Awful. It is set up in the very beginning of the movie that they say in a very quick, missable line of dialogue that mom and dad had a fight last night and she stayed at grandma's for the night. And they don't know if she's going to come home today. And it's like, wow, that's our setup. That is a really dramatic place to kick off this family dynamic. It is, but they, they breeze past it because they don't want it to be too dark, which I understand. There is no reason to have that in the movie by the time we have gone through the entire movie. It makes no difference right. because there is nothing communicated through the performance and the script between these characters, the Zelenskys, that enforces that kind of drama. Because when they're around each other, they're perfectly civil, they seem okay, and it seems to be hinging on, well, if you know, if Wayne can sell this shrinking device and and prove that it works, everything's great. I cannot remember the wife's name because she was just the wife in this movie. Yeah, yeah, it's it's unfortunate. And um, she is a she is a non-character. She is given the worst hack moments in the movie. One that I think has to be pointed out for how bad it is, is this whole time it's like, okay, he tells her they shrunk the kids and she has to have, you know, a, a movie fainting moment. But then of course she's out there helping him. And it's like, there, there's no sense of genuine tension between them, considering that that was how their entire re relationship dynamic was sold to us in the, in the first line of dialogue relaying information about them to us. There is nothing of that present in the actual movie. So then when he tells her that they've shrunk and they've been looking for him, he goes up to his lab, Wayne, and, and apparently stays up all night trying to figure out a way to fix the shrinking ray, which he broke in a fit of rage, believing that it didn't work, which is a good conflict. But like, that's a good piece of, you know, problem solving to set up. Right. But you're only, it's only there long enough to recognize mechanically, like what the stakes are. I really wish there had been some more exploration of like moments of horror with these kids where like they realize, Oh, Oh, we are screwed. And it doesn't have to be dark, but at least just spend enough time with the moments, at least spend enough time with the kids realizing these things. The initial shrinking, there is no real, again, there is no moment to breathe of like, Oh my God, we've been shrunk. Like right. the action kicks off immediately. The initial shrinking actually happens off camera. Right. That's very true. So this moment that I, I can't, I can't believe how much I, I genuinely, I can say this and I don't like to say this. I hated this moment. It sucked. Um, it sucked. I'll give you that. He's apparently stayed up all night and I guess has been trying, doing calculations and stuffing and wife comes in and wife looks at him and he's fallen asleep in his desk. And then it goes back over to her and she just smiles and she may like, she may as well look directly into the camera and says, she just goes, I love you, Wayne Zelensky. And I was like, I, I, I threw my hands up in disgust. I'm like, this is awful. This is the most unearned thing in this movie. And it feels like a total betrayal of anything that it's trying to go for. At least Matt Frewer, I give I give it this. There is this ongoing thread of like he's the captain of the football team and his son got cut from the team but it turns out that his son actually quit the team. Like it's this is all again not delivered well because it's also rapid fire, but there's like there's things there. Like there's something there that eventually does have an arc. But on the Zelensky side of things, it's it's nothing. There's there's a quick shorthand establishment in the opening that the young nerdy son is seeking his dad's approval by being like his dad. He's making like a little miniature like heat ray or something. And he wants to show it to his dad and his dad's too big. He's like, oh, I can't come down. Like, you know, I can't come down for breakfast right now, bud. And his son walks away dejectedly. And it's like, okay, I've seen this beat a million times, but it, it functions. And so it's like, all right, that's going to be the arc for this kid. He wants to prove himself to his dad. And eventually he does, but it's an arc that feels kind to call it an afterthought. So here I think we have 
obviously I'm not laying this all at his feet, but a symptom of a director who really doesn't have a great grasp of um, conveying these emotional beats and also doesn't have a great grasp of humor. Like all of this would be so much more forgivable if the movie were really funny. And if you look at Joe Johnston's filmography, he has certainly improved at adding humor to his movies over time, but it's not like they've gotten really, really funny. You know, Captain America, the first Avenger, certainly not all that funny. Um, The Wolfman, Jurassic Park 3, Hidalgo, October Sky, you know, there are humorous elements in these things, but it's not like Joe Johnston is a master of comedy. He's not really a jack of all trades. He really excels at making spectacles and, and effects films. And I think that's wonderful. You know, he does such a great job of that. But as far as making movies where like emotional beats land, that's something that I, I really haven't felt throughout his filmography. And then as far as the script goes, like this kind of brevity and it's kind of, you know, desire to breeze through so much of this stuff and sort of make it strictly transactional. You can tell that this is written into the script. So it's not just a matter of like them taking it into the editing room and cutting all the good things out of it. No, this, this was written to be breezy and you can tell like it's in things like scene transitions that are pre-written. It's like, ah, they really wanted this fucker to move. They wanted this to jam. It does, and, and it, it races to the climax, and unfortunately, the sprint that it took to get there, the movie's so winded by the end that the ending falls really flat. It, it's a very limp ending um, because the big climactic moment is that the kids do get in the house, but then the sun gets dropped into the cereal bowl that, the, the, of Cheerios that Rick Moranis is eating. He's just right about to eat him before Quark, the family dog, can bite him to stop him and make him realize that it's like, okay, there's my kid. And then after that, the ending really just plays out like a, a, a really sleepy denouement. Exactly. It should be the climax of the movie where it's like, all right, we got to figure out how do we fix the shrinking machine to blow them back up. And there's all this talk. It's like, okay, this, you know, a baseball came through here and stopped the heat of the laser and yada, yada, yada. And again, Matt Frewer gets the best thing in the movie. I mean, at least the best beat of this moment where they're like, well, we got to test it out to make sure it works. And Matt Frewer is like, use it on me. Like you got to use it on me. And it's like, okay, like this is an interesting, you know, he's willing to do this for his kids. It shows he loves his kids, all that stuff. You know, he, he's been a hard ass and and kind of a prick, but he's a good dad. So they'll, they'll do that. And then they just, they blow him back up. There's a really weird contrived Brit bit where Matt Frewer extends his hand for a handshake to Wayne. And I'm like, what was this? This wasn't yeah. like th- there was never the sense that part of the drama of the movie was some kind of reconciliation between these two neighbors. They continually trade barbs in, in a sense um, and kind of comment on each other. But there was never an emotion like when Matt Frewer <laughs> extended his hand for the handshake. I was like, where is this coming from? Right, exactly. You know, and it's it's things that are sort of established in shorthand that are resolved transactionally where I'm like, yeah, that's contrived and, and simply just unearned by the film. And, and yeah, I think this this ending sequence is climactic sequence where they're uh, getting everybody back to their correct sizes. You know, all the tension and all the conflict is pretty much bled out of the movie at this point. There's really only things to, to uh, resolve transactionally where it's like, yeah, point the beam at the kids and, you know, let's, let's get everybody out of here. And I just wish this movie had had a better sense of a ticking clock where it's like, we have to get back and do this by this time or else all is lost. You need another reason for this movie to be racing. Like I can't. No. In fact, I think it would be another reason for the movie to feel like um, the the kids aren't making the kind of progress they want because that would add additional conflict. I mean, I, I, I definitely agree that there could be another element of if we don't do this by then, like we're going to be stuck like this forever or, you know, whatever. I just, uh, you know, upon rewatching this, this is probably the first time I've ever rewatched this in full. My my big takeaway is that like I want to watch like a highlight reel of just the big effect stuff because all of that stuff I I loved I really really loved I mean we 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 said we were going to come back to it so I just want to reiterate again the scorpion fight is so awesome and so amazing it's one of my favorite things that we've watched so far for genre vision uh, this year um, and of course it has to kill Auntie their their aunt buddy which is it's like oh that's you know so tragic whatever. Um, <laughs> you know, I didn't really care, but it was, it was fun and it was cool. And then I'm, I'm glad they at least put that kind of perilous beat in there. Like I, I that's another thing, you know, kind of the, the movie 
shows these kids getting hurt and scuffed up and even bloody at times. It it does it does succeed in making you feel like these kids are in trouble. Yeah, yeah, I, and I wish that the movie spent more time making those like we're in trouble beats land and the kids have to deal with those things emotionally that yeah it's it's that they these kids are in physical trouble but there is no emotional trouble that ever comes across as uh, i I won't say sincere because it's it is trying to have sincere beats but all the all the sincere beats are just so one note and contrived and you know like shy neighbor boy really likes popular neighbor girl and like that's it there's nothing beyond that there's nothing more definitive the overall impression I get, you know, in summation of this film is like, this should have been a film that you could describe as an, as an adventure film. But the impression I get of it after seeing it is like, well, this would have felt more like an adventure film if it had actually spent the time with fewer characters, uh, really focused down the perspective and really reorganized its priorities around the kids in the adventure situation and the survival situation that they're in. An adventure film can be funny. An adventure film can go through a series of varied locations. I mean, just look at, you know, the classic Raiders of the Lost Ark. We have a lot of characters. We have ticking clocks, lots of different varied action scenes, and plenty of comic relief. There are structural elements, I think, there that really bolster the sense of adventure that this movie could have also used to bolster its adventure uh, genre, basically. Because, it, yeah, it's I think, you know, structurally, it's like, OK, it's easy to say that's an adventure film, but it doesn't feel like one when you watch it. Instead, it feels like an effect showcase. On that note, I, I, I've, I've thought of an example. Um, thinking about Lord of the Rings and particularly Fellowship of the Ring, those movies became lampooned and joked about because it was like oh these characters are always walking all they're doing is walking 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 but i immediately think about the scene in fellowship of the ring where the characters are walking and the ring gets dropped and boromir picks up the ring it is in this moment that there is an an immense character beat like one of the most important character beats in that movie i feel and it is a moment that is full of drama that's full of tension in this ensemble cast that allows this moment between the characters to breathe and to feel a tension that reinforces the larger problem of the movie. Yep. You've got a big ensemble cast, but it's also very important that you have one perspective that dominates and that's Frodo. Uh, even though, you know, there are other perspectives that are incredibly important that we spend time sort of seeing the, the story through the eyes, you know, through their eyes. Um, but Frodo's perspective of course is the dominant one because he is saddled with the heaviest weight and I think people could argue it's like, oh, well, the, that movie is three hours. It's got plenty of time for that stuff. But you can do a lot more with the kind of running time that Honey, I Shrunk the Kids has uh, if you shrink back on other ineffective things. I think you hit the nail on the head when we talked about private, privately where it's, it's a movie I want to like more than I actually do. And like the more I talk about it, the more I think about it, I don't actually really like the movie overall. But the things that it's the, – the, the few things that it's doing well – is really the thing that it's setting out to do the most, which is give you the marquee value of the kids being shrunk. And it does. It it nails that so well on a purely technical level. The technical aspects of this movie, executing all of that extremely well, but it is all hindered so much by the pacing, the lack of deeper character, um, and like you said, frankly, not being a very funny movie for what is ostensibly supposed to be an adventure comedy. Correct. And so, yeah, this is um, our first installment in March Madness, which is about mad scientists. Wayne Zielinski is not a typical mad scientist. He, he has big dreams. He has kooky off the wall ideas that are supposed to be uh, revolutionary. They actually get him laughed out of a, a scene early on where his peers are supposed to be judging his ideas. And he's just too damn radical. His head's in the clouds and he, you know, his ideas are laughable. Another stock trope scene. Right. That's the shorthand. Evil scientists would use that scene and go, well, I'll show them. Uh, I'll build a creature more fierce than anything they've ever seen. You know, that kind of a race of atomic supermen. Um, (laughs) Yet another sample to put in a Rob Zombie song. Uh, (laughs) Going into this, and I'm this is just my hypothesis, my scientific method going into this theme month is I'm going to posit that there are two types of movie mad scientists. There is 
the mad scientist who is evil and nefarious and is power hungry and, you know, is just consumed by their science to the point that it drives them mad. And then there's the kooky mad scientist. This is, uh, doesn't always have to be a a good character, but it's most often aligned with the side of good in in a movie. And while they are crazy, uh, or, you know, I shouldn't say that while they are kind of off kilter and eccentric, their, their alignment with being good and their, uh, intentions with their mad scientists are often, if not noble, not necessarily, you know, anarchic or ag- aggressive, you know, your doc Browns and sure. everything like that. Yeah. But here's the thing is that we, we decided to start this month with a scientist who's, I mean, he certainly leans more towards the, he certainly doesn't lean towards the evil side, but he's like, he's kind of often this like bland saltine cracker land of scientists where he, he's much more, his archetype is actually much more the, business dad. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He could be a lawyer or something. He could be a dentist, right. you know, whatever. Exactly. He He's too, he's too busy for his kids. You know, he can't come down to breakfast. He's consumed with his work. The fact that he's an inventor and a scientist is really just a, a, uh, a vehicle for the premise. Now, granted, Rick Moranis gets to do kooky things like wear a whole bunch of helmet things that are helping him to look for, you know, his tiny children and things like that. But he doesn't really, he, he he's much more white collar as far as mad science. Really, he this is less of a mad scientist movie and more just a mad science movie. Yeah, yeah, that's a great way to summarize the movie. Uh, if you wanted to find more mad science movies, then you would go to The Shelf. Uh, the Shelf is something we do here at Genre Vision that is all about recommendations, pairings, and substitutions. The Shelf is a collaborative thing, so we ask you to go to genrevision.com and find the post for uh, this episode and leave your picks for The Shelf, you know, what you're going to pull off the shelf to recommend with this movie, and um, we'll read it on the very next episode. Uh, Drew, what are you pulling off the shelf for Honey, I Shrunk the Kids? Excuse me while I, I do some extreme nerd movie trivia stuff, so... Stuart Gordon uh, and Dennis Paley, but primarily Stuart Gordon, uh, did a lot of movies for Charles Band under his Empire Pictures banner and also Full Moon. Charles Band was and still is notorious for making a lot of Tiny Things movies. He, you know, the Puppet Master movies, and you have no idea how many Tiny Things movies. This guy, it, it's just his thing. <laughs> yes. Uh, it is so his thing in a weird way that I don't think any other film producer has ever had like the chance to do that thing so much. (laughs) Um, And uh, what's interesting is that one of the effects directors on this movie was David Allen. David Allen has done countless miniature stop motion uh, effect sequences for empire pictures and full moon pictures. Um, He also did the, he did them for the puppet master, uh, at least the first one I know. Um, And, this connection feels so much when I, you know, find out that Stuart Gordon wrote the script. It's like this, this feels like a full moon empire pictures movie, but with a Disney budget, like it is that big high concept. Like this is what we're selling you. So I decided to pick a, one of those movies and I, I wanted to pick a kid's movie, which would be from the Moonbeam entertainment arm of full moon pictures, which is their kids films. And I'm going to go with Prehysteria from 1993. The, I mean, this is this was uh, Charles Band basically going, oh, they're going to make Jurassic Park. Well, I'm going to do Jurassic Park, but you know what? You know what I think would be a really cool twist on Jurassic Park. <laughs> what, what what could it possibly be, Charles? What if the dinosaurs were tiny? And so this is a tiny dinosaur movie where tiny dinosaurs run amok in a household uh, where the dad is played by none other than Optimus Prime himself, Brett Cullen. Um, That was Peter Cullen. (laughs) Oh, yes, yes, I'm sorry. Peter Cullen is Optimus Prime. Brett Cullen is the other guy. Uh, You know, he's been in so many friggin' things. Oh, Peter, his name is Peter Brett Cullen. Huh. That's Optimus Prime, right? No, it's a different guy. Oh, my God. (laughs) 
No wonder he calls himself Brett Cullen because Peter Cullen is a voice actor. Peter Cullen often has often wears a mustache and and sounds like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Freedom is the right of all sentient beings. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> he has a big ring, a big plastic ring on his back, and you can yank it, and a string comes out, and he says a bunch of stuff. That's how he got that career, you know. Yeah, exactly. It's just Autobots roll out. Uh, <laughs> Stop <laughs> lubricating the human. I'm going to yeah, kill my yeah, fucking bumble, voice. Bumblebee. Uh, <laughs> he also did the Predator clicks. Got to give him that. Hey, so there you go. But not. it's not Brett Cullen, though. It's the other guy, it's, Peter it's, Cullen, it's Peter who Cullen, is not see? Peter Brett Cullen. So, uh, so anyways, pre-hysteria, that, which also stars uh, was Austin O'Brien, who you might know from Last Action Hero and what we'll know from The Lawnmower Man. He was the the kid whose dad was abusive to him and was like buddies with uh, with Job, with uh, Jeff Fahey. Uh, he's he's the the male kid in Prehysteria. I won't lie. I was trying to watch Prehysteria before we recorded this, and I didn't get around to doing it. So I was just watching clips of it on YouTube. Um, and I don't know. I want to watch that movie again because they made three of those movies. Um, I saw all three of them I know as a kid. I know the third one's about like a, a mini golf uh, business that gets the tiny dinosaurs and the tiny dinosaurs help revitalize the mini golf business. Um, cool. <laughs> which is just wacky, but you know, uh, tiny things. Um, there, there's so many tiny movies, uh, out there that, that I think would be, would be fun for this. But the fact that it's so connected to like my specific, wonderful dumpster dive of B movie cinema, like empire pictures and full moon. I, I gotta, I gotta give it to that. So pre hysteria, it is available to watch for free on Tubi. Travis, what are you going to pull off the shelf for honey? I shrunk the kids. Uh, I'm going to pull up Jurassic park three, which is also directed by Joe Johnston. We did two dinosaur movies. We didn't plan this. Yeah. Dinosaurs happen uh, frequently on this show. So anyway, uh, the reason I chose this one is it is an adventure film directed by Joe Johnston, where characters are sort of lost in a jungle with odd creatures. There's a lot that's kind of structurally similar here uh, with honey. I shrunk the kids. Uh, but I feel like this is, it actually kind of pulls off the adventure film aspect of it because it has a stronger sense of perspective, smaller ensemble, um, incredible effects. This is a great effects movie. Uh, I think Jurassic Park three would be way more fondly remembered if there were a couple of things missing from it. And number one, it's the like si- things like silly dream sequences, like that silly dream sequence is one of the reasons uh, I, don't, it's one of the reasons I like the movie. Shut up, shut up. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't tell. I, I don't want that to be erased. I love, that's one of the best things about Jurassic Park three, but I, I understand what you're saying. I understand why people don't like it because it is silly. I like silly things anyway. Um, and it also has an ending that sucks. Yes. The ending just sucks. And that ruins movies for many people. And I understand why uh, endings are very, very important parts of stories. And if they don't accurately summarize or, you know, give closure or poetically comment upon what's happened before, then, uh, they feel like mm, not much has transpired. And that's kind of the feeling that you get at the end of Jurassic Park three. But I think most of the stuff that comes before the ending in Jurassic Park three is, Pretty fucking good as a simple, straightforward adventure film on Dinosaur Island. Uh, thank you, Jurassic Park 3, for being as good as you are, despite your crappy, anticlimactic ending, uh, which is something else that Honey, I Shrunk the Kids shares with it. That's true. Uh, but we we do stand Jurassic Park 3, and uh, so does Sam Neill. So we're we're on the right side as far, I'm, as far as I'm concerned. If Sam Neill's doing something, I'm into it. Well, uh, to head over to the listener shelf picks for last week's episode on The Legend of the Seven Golden Vampires, we have Mr. Milksteak with The Return of the Living Dead and From Dusk Till Dawn. Eric Johnson went with Big Trouble in Little China. Stephen S. Bella had Captain Kronos, Vampire Hunter, which I almost suggested for last month. I think that might be, if we revisit Hammer Month, I think we got to do Captain Kronos. Uh, Eric Fuchs had Frankenstein Conquers the World, the the Kaiju Toho movie. And, uh, Cthulhu Ferrigno had five deadly venoms, uh, recommending that as the Shaw Brothers movie we need to see and look at. After the one-two punch of Legend of the Seven Golden Vampires and Boxer's Omen, we're, we're in with the Shaw Brothers stuff. We're, yeah. we're on board. Mm-hmm. Expect to hear the five venoms on this show. Yes, very, very likely. Uh, so thank you, everybody, for those listener shelf picks. Love seeing those every week and looking forward to next week's. And now we are going to do some calls to action, but stick around because we are going to talk about the WandaVision finale, spoiler free, uh, after this. And uh, we've also got our comment of the week coming up. 
But we do have some calls to action and some really, really fun ones this week. Uh, Travis, you're going to be doing some guest spots on some podcasts coming up. Correct. We are working with our friend Deanna Chapman, and uh, I'm going to be on her podcast's uh, Chat Cemetery coming up. And then I just had an episode uh, where I guested on her show, Welcome to Geekdom. That is available now. I'm talking about the band Motion City soundtrack. Uh, and for her podcast, Chat Cemetery, I'm talking about the Stephen King book, uh, Full Dark New Stars. So check out those feeds uh, for some Travis Newton content. Uh, and also listen to those podcasts. They're great. We like working with Deanna. She makes good stuff. Heck yeah. And then in other good news, we've got a new review on the Apple Podcast Store. Yes, we do. This comes from Dog 5000 who gave us five stars and says, Masterpiece Podcast. Oh, just, oh, my heart is so full. Uh, thank you so much. They, they say, nuanced and fair talk about our favorite genre films on the merits. When you've just seen that movie that blew your mind and have to talk about it with somebody, these guys are there to share your experience and laugh or cry along with you. Really, the best movie club out there. The zeal and passion for the subject matter is there week after week. Wow. Thank you so much, B-Dog 5000. That, uh, poof, I mean... It's extremely flattering, and I do like being flattered. So yeah. <laughs> thank you. Uh, it, it 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 really really puts a pep in our step. And because you left a review, that is going to help us out so so much on the Apple Podcast Store. So if you want to be awesome, like B Dog Five Thousand, go to the Apple Podcast Store, leave us a rating and a review. If you leave a written review, we will feature it here on the show. It is the best marketing tool we have right now. So if you want to get this show up and out there to more people. The the rating and reviewing it on the Apple Podcast Store is the best way to do that right now. And if you want more of us talking about stuff, you can go to patreon.com slash genre revision. We just recorded our monthly more currently consuming. uh, And we did that with our genre vision sister, Danielle Ryan. Hi, Danny. Hi, Danny. We talked about things ranging from killer cockroaches to Sasquatches to Billie Eilish, all sorts of movies and television and fun stuff. Uh, on that we love doing those monthly currently consumings and that is exclusive for our premium subscribers at patreon.com slash genre vision it's just five bucks a month and you get access to all all so much extra content over there uh hours upon hours of content and uh we do stuff every week we do a weekly pre-show uh we we just did this week which is also tying into one of our other shows uh finflix so patreon.com slash genre vision go check that out Let's do some currently consuming. Nom, 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 nom. And uh, we're going to double up because we both watched the WandaVision finale. And uh, again, we will stay spoiler free. And I will say overall, I I enjoyed my time with WandaVision. By the end, it went pretty much where I figured it was going to be in terms of style and everything. And that it, it became an MCU product. That is exactly right. You know, what I really love about this show is... I think that that they I think that they went pretty hard on the sort of mystery box thing early on where a lot of people were wondering what is this? What is this show really? Because the marketing was a little mm, uh a little evasive I think initially because people were like I'm not I'm not quite sure what this is. Is it just, you know, uh, Wanda Maximoff and the Vision emulating classic sitcoms from different eras. Like, what's what's really going on here? So there was this big element of mystery that gradually revealed itself over the course of nine weeks, and following along with that was fun. And to see the extent they they went to to emulate all these uh, classic sitcoms like I Love Lucy and The Brady Bunch and I Dream of Jeannie and Malcolm in the Middle and Modern Family, it's like, oh, they really understood the art form of the American sitcom. And they actually used that understanding to their advantage to create a really interesting show. Uh, I really loved that about it. And then eventually the show got wrapped up in pretty standard MCU stuff. And then it injected something that was really fun, that really fun villain came out of it. But all in all, it came back around to just being in the finale, pretty standard MCU fare, which from one perspective, it's disappointing, but I'm glad that the show actually opened up some kind of crevices and nooks and crannies to explore these characters further than we normally see. Agreed. I, I, I pretty much agree with you on all points. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with how the show turned out. I don't really care about it as like a continuing piece of the never ending MCU puzzle and like what it's setting up. That doesn't really interest me. Um, there was some, 
I think, solid dramatic beats and even some lingering weirdness in the finale that I liked. Sure. I think the first I think the first maybe two episodes are things that are like worth revisiting just for artistic merit alone. But I can't yes. ever see myself rewatching the show as a whole as a piece no. of art because it's the MCU is all about what's next. Exactly. It 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 feels good to get something like this, but I don't expect the MCU to continue to do this kind of experimental stuff. Like even the stuff that is coming up that looks like it could be, Ooh, look, Loki is going to be doing wacky stuff. It's like, yeah, but it's MCU wacky, you know? Right. Like, and, and that's, that's kind of where the show and it was like, initially it's like, no, this is legit wacky. This is something weird and different tonally and stylistically than anything we've seen in the MCU. And it's dealing with themes In very intriguing ways, like it's about something, not just character wise, but in a bigger, you know, commentary about fiction, about uh, specifically uh, sitcoms and their effects on people. I was like, this is fascinating and deep. And then eventually it turned into like, yeah, but who is this character and what are they setting up and how does this connect to this? And it's like, yep, we're right back in the MCU and stylistically filmmaking wise. It also fell into those tropes as it went on. Right. But, but you know, I, I enjoyed my time with it, but like you, I'd say it's like, yeah, I don't, I can't ever see myself revisiting it as, as a whole um, because it just is clearly that's what I feel so much of these Marvel Disney series are going to be. It's like, these are just pieces, the next chain, you know, the next link in the chain. Right. Yeah. It's all about what's what's next and what it's setting up for, you know, uh, the multiverse and, you know, the next Doctor Strange movie. And, you know, how are the X-Men going to be incorporated into this? It's like all of it's, you know, it's people are going to be interested in fan theories and, you know, commodifying their suspicions. It's like I, you know, I, I wish I could divorce myself fully from all that kind of stuff. But now these MCU entries, whether they're theatrical or in show format, they're aware of all that. And so now they have to stay a step ahead. Not even a step ahead. They, 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 they cater to that. They do. And that, that's part of what makes this sort of stuff tiresome. And part of, you know, part of the reason we don't do full episodes on MCU entries anymore. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, Hey, if there's one that interests us, we, we certainly reserve the right, you know, if Dr. Strange in the multiverse of madness looks good enough, we'll do an episode on it, but no guarantees. I, I'm certainly looking forward to that movie at this point though. Anything from Sam Raimi, Jesus, anything at all. We'll take it. Well, now we are going to wrap things up with our comment of the week. This is actually the thread of the week because I, I can't believe that we got this many responses to the legend of the seven golden vampires. Y'all came out and that's when, whenever it's for like these movies where we're like, this is so, this is like the nichest of niche for even us. This will be our little thing. The fact that we got so many comments on this episode just puts the biggest smile on my face. And there was this thread that was kind of started by loyal listener and commenter, Eric Johnson, who went with the shelf who went with the shelf pick Big Trouble in Little China. And this ended up becoming a conversation between Eric Johnson, Stephen Nespella, and Cthulhu Ferrigno, which, and Mr. Milksteak, I should say. This was a big thread uh, where they started talking about the, <laughs> the proposed remake of Big Trouble that was going to happen with Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, and the validity of The Rock playing the Jack Burton character played by Kurt. You, please go read this thread. It's so great. Because it is once again cultivating that movie club mood that we're going for here at Genre Vision, where people were just being really nice and delightful and having a good conversation and offering their opinions and having fun talking about these movies. And, and that's that's just what we're doing here. And it's so awesome that you guys continue to do that in the comments section. And, you know, to, to date, you know, knock on wood. It has never devolved into anything that we feel we need to step in for or anything. You, you guys rock the comments section every week. Absolutely agree. You know, we curate movies and you all curate excellent comments in our comments section. So glad to see everybody holding up their end of the deal. This is what makes Genre Vision such a fun movie club. Absolutely. And uh, we're going to continue Mad Scientist Month, March Madness as we're calling it, with The Avengers. No, not that one. No, we're doing the 1998 version, The Avengers, which uh, based off the TV show starring Ray Fiennes, Uma Thurman and Sean Connery as our mad scientist. Oh, boy, I can't. I've not revisited this in probably 20 years or something. I'm so stoked. And Travis, you've never seen this, right? I've never seen it. I've always known it to be an infamous bomb. So uh, we will find out what is going on in The Avengers next week right here on Genre Vision. <laughs>